Welcome to Cyclopod, showcasing work by early career geoscientists that is of interest to the cyclostatigraphic community. This podcast is made possible thanks to financial support of the International Subcommissional Timescale Calibration. Hi there, and welcome to the 13th episode of Cyclopod. Uh, my name is Anna Jo Drury, and I'm a stabilized site geochemist and cyclostatigrapher interested in uh, the paleoclimates and paleoceanography of the Cenozoic in particular. And uh, yeah, I'm really excited to be joining David as co-host of Cyclopod from now on. Welcome, Anna Joy. It's really wonderful to have you here next to me for this 13th episode of Cyclopod already. This time around, our guest is Mohamed Farhat. Mohamed is originally from Beirut in Lebanon, but the last three years he spent in Paris, doing a PhD with Jacques Lascar at the Paris Observatory. More specifically, he did his PhD at the institute with the most beautiful institute name that we will ever have here on Cyclopod, and that is l'Institut de Mécanique Céleste et de Calcul des Ephémérides. Isn't that beautiful? So that roughly translates to the Institute of Celestial Mechanics and the Calculation of the Ephemerides. Mohamed, you just defended your PhD in January. How did it go? It was, uh, so as you know, in France, we do a presentation. I don't think that's the case everywhere. So we do a presentation of the work, followed by the, uh, the questions of the jury. So it was, uh, it was a huge jury. It was, uh, it was like eight to nine people. And, uh, you know, the difficulty was that everyone is coming from a different field. So everyone was, uh, uh, uh opening, uh, uh, or discussing what he's interested in. <laughs> so it was not easy at all, and I'm, I'm talking very different fields. So we had astrophysicists, uh, geophysicists, uh, geolo- geo- geologists, uh, 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 dynamicists, you name it. So, but it was it was really fun. Ah, oh, great, great to hear that. Um, and what are you up to now? I started my uh, postdoc at the same institute, so I'm still working with the team. And I'm still focused on the Earth-Moon system and the uh, evolution over much long time scales uh, of the Earth-Moon system in the past. So that's what I'm currently focused on. Yeah, that sounds like a very nice pathway for for your career, Mohammed. Yeah, yeah, indeed. <laughs> okay, so um, today on Psychopod, um, we are going to talk about you know what I think is really the masterpiece of your PhD, and uh, namely your paper in astronomy and astrophysics on the resonant tidal evolution of the Earth-Moon distance. Um, Now, with this paper, you show that the evolution of the Earth-Moon system is not a smooth process, uh, with the Moon gradually going further and further away from the Earth. Instead, you show uh, that it's a process with boring intervals for several billions of years, uh, as well as uh, rapid changes in the Earth-Moon system on million-year timescales. Um, so, yeah, that's really great work, uh, Mohammed. Um, and before we go into the details of your work, uh, would you be able to explain how and why the Earth's moon system is changing at all? Yeah, basically. So if you start thinking forward in time, the moon was very close to the Earth. So today it's roughly 60 Earth radii away, uh, some 300,000 kilometers away. But uh, uh, very early on, upon moon, lunar formation, it was only a few Earth radii away. And then the moon ever since has been receding from us or moving away from us. And to do with what we call the tidal interactions in the Earth-Moon Sun system. So basically, if you take the Earth as a rigid body, so it does not deform at all. And if you take it as a sphere, as a rigid sphere, then uh, our life as modelers would be much easier. But because the Earth is a deformable body, and because uh, it's not spherical, and because the moon... Uh, exerts this gravitational pull on one surface of the Earth, which is the closer surface to it, uh, much more than what it exerts on the other surface of the Earth, so the Earth deforms. And because of this deformation, you have a mass redistribution that's happening in the Earth. And the Earth, of course, is not a homogeneous body, so you have mass redistribution happening in the oceans, in the solid interior, and in the solid interior also through different layers, you have different kinds of mass redistribution. So it basically comes down to this mass distribution. Because the Earth is deforming, it creates this bulge, which is oriented towards the moon, which is exerting the gravitational pull. And so this bulge, or this mass distribution, is what actually uh, uh, controls the evolution of the system. Because if the Earth were 
were just a sphere and then uh, the moon would be at a, at a constant orbit always revolving on it nothing is changing but because we're having this deformation in the earth uh, 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 this massive distribution which is resulting from tidal forces exerts an additional force on the moon and it uh, so it's not a force basically it's a torque because we're dealing with rotational motion so this torque carries momentum exchange between the earth and the moon so we would be giving momentum orbital momentum to the moon so its orbit would expand and we would be losing the momentum we give to the moon as uh, uh, on earth so the earth's rotational motion would be uh, uh, slowed down and so the length of day would be increasing with time Yeah, wow, that, that was a very clear explanation, Mohammed. Thank you. So I understand that um, the moon is receding from us, going further and further away. And if I'm not mistaken, we can measure that now very accurately with lasers. We can accurately and precisely measure how fast the moon is um, receding from the Earth. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, ever since, uh, 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 I don't remember exactly the number, but one of the Apollo missions, Uh, in the late 1960s, we started installing some uh, laser reflectors on the surface of the moon, and we're uh, hitting these laser reflectors with lasers, and we're measuring the time it takes for these lasers to come back, and we can measure the distance between the Earth and the moon. And we've been doing so over decades, so we can measure the variation in this Earth-moon distance. And so the precision of this uh, 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 experiments are also increasing, So now we know that the moon is moving away from us at a rate which is roughly four centimeters per year, more precisely 3.8 centimeters per year. And we can actually measure, measure it now to submillimeter precision because we have many uh, 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 reflectors now because we had many missions and we have many lasers on Earth. So we have many observatories doing this kind of what we call lunar laser ranging experiments. So yeah, we can measure the, the, the recession of the moon and we can measure it to sub-millimeter precision. Okay, that's very clear, Mohammed. But if we extrapolate that speed back in time, we have a problem, right? Indeed, indeed. And so this is, a, this is the problem that we addressed in this work, which is called the time scale problem of lunar origin. Uh, uh, or what, uh, what, uh, what was called in the 60s, uh, the last century by, uh, uh, by Monk as the Gernitzkorn event. So basically, if you take this rate at which the moon is receding away from us today, which is this 3.8 centimeter or so, and if you uh, uh, try to see what kind of deformation of the Earth would correspond to this rate of recession of the moon, so what kind of angular momentum exchange between the Earth and the moon, and what kind of massive distribution is happening on the Earth, And, what, and so if you take this kind of exchange of angular momentum and you extrapolate backwards in time using a homogeneous model of the Earth, so not accounting for all the stratification and different layering and different responses of the different layers of the Earth, you would find that the moon would actually collide with the Earth, as it should, but the collision between the Earth and the moon, or the moon would be very close to the Earth only around 1.6 to 1.8 billion years ago. And we know that's not the case because we know that the moon started close to the Earth, roughly the same age of the Earth, which is 4.5 billion years ago. So this inconsistency between the age we know of the moon and what we get in tidal modeling, if we use this rate that we measure today, is what we call the time scale problem. Okay, thank, yeah, thanks for explaining that, um, Mohammed. So, so then if I understand that correctly, um, this means that... Uh, Things like the tides were exerting less friction on the Earth in the geological past compared to today. Yeah, exactly. So, so, so it makes sense to say that because if we take this rate uh, and we extrapolate backwards in time, and we get this very early collision or very recent, sorry, collision between the Earth and the Moon, then the rate is at the present much higher than it was in the past. So, it, in the past, it, it should have been much lower. And so it's it's also uh, 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 makes sense to say that tides at the present are much stronger than they were in the past. Uh, what what we can say after our model results is that things are not monotonic. So uh, it is indeed very high at the present, but it doesn't mean that it was always lower in the past. It, it encounters some states where it was higher in the past, sometimes lower. It's it's just irregular. So. In the work you just mentioned, you are applying an ocean model that calculates the Earth-Moon system back into geological time. 
And basically, there are only two parameters that are free or unconstrained that we don't know really what their value was, but that need to be determined in your model. And that first parameter you call sigma. Sigma is a measure for the strength of water friction at the bottom of the ocean. And then the second parameter is H. And H is a very easy one. It's the effective ocean thickness. So basically how deep the oceans are on average. Uh, you understood it perfectly correct. Yes. Uh, so, so basically it's a model and models are parameterized. And you, and you know, when, when we, when we uh, study the, the evolution of the earth over such a prolonged time, there's a lot of unknowns. Certainly we don't know precisely how oceans are varying, how continents are varying. We have models of plate tectonics, but uh, uh, ocean volume is not the same. A continental configuration is not the same how oceans dissipate energy. And so dissipation of energy is the main driver of this ex angular momentum exchange between the Earth and the Moon. So so we need to model all these elements going backwards in time. So we would have this model and we try to allow for as much physics as we can with these uh, simple parameters. And then we try to see what kind of parameters would fit the observables that we have. So for these ocean oceanic models, we have an oceanic thickness, and we have a parameter which which is what you uh, 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 what you talked about as sigma, which is how much is this ocean dissipating energy, and this comes down to very complex uh, mechanisms of energy dissipation within the ocean. So you have energy dissipation in shallow seas, energy dissipation in deep seas, uh, uh, a lot of internal oceanic dynamics and generation of waves that happen, all coming down to this uh, sigma parameter. And so these two free parameters, we try to constrain them to see what kind of values would give us the proper age of the moon and the proper recession at the present. And so this combined model that you use, uh, that reconciles the current rate of uh, recession and the age of the moon, right? I, exactly. So that's, I think that's the, uh, that's what this model does that, uh, that is missing from other models. So basically, all models have these kind of three parameters, right? So all models dealing with oceanic dynamics, because we do not know exactly how, uh, uh, what are the exact or precise pathways of dissipation. So we do not know exactly the sigma frequency in the oceans, and we do not know exactly the evolution of oceanic volume in the past. So all kind of uh, models dealing with these uh, simplified geometries of the ocean have these parameters, but we took things a step further and we tried to constrain the values. So we, we take whatever values of these parameters and then we try to see what pair of, of, uh, of parameters or values of these parameters would give us exactly the age of the moon and the, uh, and the present rate of a lunar recession. So that's an impressive model result, Mohammed. But when it comes to um, other constraints we have, like, for example, we know the depth of the ocean and we have some uh, idea of um, cyclostography. Um, do your model parameters fit those as well? Yes, so very good point. So uh, um, so when we when we were constructing our model, we were aware of the history and literature, of course, of these uh, uh, constraints. So you have the tidal read mites and you have cyclostratigraphy. But uh, because uh, some of the, the these data points already de depend on some tidal models, so in some cyclostratigraphic inferences, you have already some dependence on astronomical uh, uh, parameters that vary in the past. Uh, we try to avoid fitting our parameters to these uh, data points to avoid circular reasoning. Plus, you would have degeneracies at certain points. So, for example, I can give you an example of uh, the Willy Wally formation, uh, 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 which is a very old uh, point. But so you have two studies that are well cited in the literature that give two different results. Uh, so it's a, it's one formation, one record. And then you have two different results on the uh, Earth Moon uh, uh, system parameters. And then when we were done with our model, we also had a cyclostatigraphic inferences beside these tidal read mites, which was the work uh, uh, by uh, Margaret Letnik and the team uh, at Utrecht, uh, uh, which was at the Joffrey member in Australia. And uh, it's also uh, about the same time of the uh, date of the Willy Wally formation. And the three do not uh, at all have the same uh, Earth moon distance at that time. So we try to avoid the circular reasoning and we try to avoid being selective on data points. 
and we try to uh, fit only to the only two data points that we know of the Earth Moon system, which is the present, and we measure that with with lunar laser ranging, and the age of the Moon, which is precisely measured uh, with geological data collected from the Moon. And the result was that the Earth Moon distance that we had was in very good agreement with most of the points, especially the oldest of them. So you have the uh, the, uh, the recent papers of uh, Latnik et al, as I mentioned, and Mayers and Marinervo. Uh, I think these data points uh, fall exactly on the curve that we had. And that was, uh, I think, uh, it was a moment of joy. Yeah, I can imagine that was a, a good a good feeling. <laughs> So it's time for the number of the month, and this month the number is 3.2 billion. Uh, so in South Africa, there are fossilized subaqueous sand waves uh, with tidal bundles that are 3.2 billion years old. And these tidal bundles have been used by different geologists to reconstruct the Earth Moon system. Um, and it's intriguing to see that these results uh, are in really good agreement with your month. Um, but now uh, there's a new drilling initiative in South Africa that's collected kilometers of new core from this geological group. And this really opens the door to reconstruct the Earth moon system by means of cyclostratigraphy. So are you excited about that? hundred uh, percent, of course. I'm looking forward for more data points, uh, especially in cyclostratigraphy. Uh, uh, so as I said, we're comparing our model against uh, uh, geological and biological data. We basically have... Uh, paleontological clocks, where you try to infer uh, the number of days in a year based on stromatolites or bivalves and the growth rates in these uh, organisms. And uh, you have uh, another, da uh, another data set, which is tidal reef mites, uh, based on tidal deposits, and it has to do with uh, counting the number of days in a month or, uh, uh, or in half a month or so. And you have cyclostratigraphy, which is based on the Milankovitch theory, and comparing uh, uh, astronomical frequencies, you have the eccentricity cycle, as you know, which is more stable than the other cycles. And then you try to count the variations of the obliquity or the precession cycle, specifically the precession cycles within an eccentricity cycle. And then you try to infer the Earth's moon distance from that quantity. So we have these three data sets, which we can infer from uh, the whereabouts of the moon and the uh, length of day on Earth earlier in the past. And uh, I'm certainly looking forward for uh, uh, more cyclostatic graphic inferences. So, Mohammed, if we follow your new model, we see long phases of very low tidal dissipation during which the Earth-Moon distance hardly changed or changed very, very slowly. You call these phases intervals of dormant torque. Can you explain us a little bit more what you mean with this term, dormant torque, and with uh, the resonances that you see over the last 700 million years? Uh, yes, of course. So if you look at the uh, at the curve of this uh, of our result, at the evolution of the or the history of the Earth Moon system and its evolution, you would see over some intervals a smooth variation in the Earth Moon distance. And over other intervals, you have uh, significant or abrupt or relatively abrupt, of course, variations in the Earth-Moon distance and the length of day and in other astronomical quantities. So basically, it has to do with how the ocean is responding to uh, the tidal forces from the moon and the sun. But to put it in simple words, uh, uh, the ocean is the major contributor in this game, although it is a, a very thin layer compared to the uh, to the radius of the Earth. But most of dissipation is actually happening in the ocean. At present, in fact, it is roughly 94%. It happens at some instances in time, uh, which has to do with overlap in frequencies between the orbital motion of the moon and the rotational motion of the Earth. It's basically what we call resonances in physics. So if you look, for example, at the, at the swing game uh, in the playground, right? The one you put your kids at in. If you always push the swing game when the uh, uh, at a certain frequency, exactly, for example, when the swing uh, uh, comes closer to you, you would get more amplitude in the in the in the in the swinging, right? So it depends when are you pushing the swing, right? And so tidal forces act exactly the same way. It depends uh, uh, an over if, if an overlap in frequencies between the motion of the swing and the time of your push. Occurs So if an overlap in frequencies occurs between tidal forces by the moon and by the sun, 
and the rotational motion of the Earth, which are controlling oceanic dynamics, then you would have amplified response in the ocean. And so when you have an amplified response in the ocean, you would have amplified dissipation. And so you see these features, which we call resonances. So these resonances occur, and then you would have extra dissipation. You would have extra angular momentum exchange between the Earth and the Moon. So the Moon, during these intervals of resonances, would move away faster than in other uh, intervals. And in the absence of resonances, you go into the background or what we call the background of the spectrum. So that would correspond to no abrupt or significant variations in the, uh, in the Earth moon distance, no abrupt angular momentum exchange, no significant angular momentum exchange. So you would have the smooth uh, 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 evolution or variation of the Earth moon distance, which is the interval that we call a dormant torque phase. So it's a dormant because it's in between resonances. So today we're in a resonance. Exactly. So when we discovered that the present rate of recession of the moon is 3.8 centimeters, and when we took that and extrapolated backwards in time and found that the moon would hit the Earth only 1.6 billion years ago, we said, okay, this is anomalously high, so this should correspond to a resonance state in the ocean. So, and in the paper, you even hypothesized that these uh, rapid changes in uh, Earth-Moon dynamics might have triggered uh, major climate developments. Uh, so, I remember you mentioned the Paleozoic uh, oxygenation events on the one hand, and the Cambrian explosion on the other hand. I'm really, uh, yeah, I'm really intrigued. Uh, could you tell us more about how that might work? It was rather a speculation because when we when we saw these resonances, and if you look at the occurrence time of these resonances, it was, a, in fact, uh, Matthias Sensai who noticed the uh, overlap between the occurrence of these resonances and some major oxygenation events, specifically for the two minor resonances at, if I remember well, uh, 300 and 700 uh, million years ago. Uh, they coincide with the new protozoic and the paleozoic oxygenation events. We said that because we know that variation in astronomical quantities drive major variations and or drive variation in, uh, in the climate and so major variations in astronomical quantities over short pe- uh, time time periods should drive significant variations in the climate so wow that is amazing mohammed um but what's the way forward now um how do we verify your model and how can cyclostratigraphers help to extend the astronomical solutions for precession and obliquity further back in time deeper into the cenozoic uh, we certainly have a, uh, added a step towards extending these solutions yes so we have an obliquity solution that goes further in time uh, and it adds the basic element which is the tidal element into the uh, lascar solution which was missing in his or which was not handled in his in his paper so now with the work with Jack, we handled tidal modeling precisely. We focused on that. So uh, we added this major uh, uh, missing element to the to the to this puzzle. But uh, there are also other elements that we that we already added in other works. So for example, the element of variation of the dynamic obliquity, which also uh, gets into the game uh, varying uh, obliquity and precession. And we handled that, uh, by the way, in a separate work uh, specifically for Cenozoic ice ages. So these add elements, but then you need to combine all these elements together. So tidal uh, interplay, uh, uh, ice age dynamical ellipticity variation, mantle convection dynamical ellipticity variation for a very refined history of precession deep into the Cenozoic. And I think your work is definitely a very important piece of the puzzle. Thank you, Mohamed, um, for giving us this very nice summary of your paper in Astronomy and Astrophysics. I'm really intrigued by the fact that the Earth-Moon distance is such a punctuated system and such a dynamic system. Until today, I I always pictured the Moon moving away from the Earth in a gradual and slow way. But what you told us today, Mohamed, that implies that it was a much, much more bumpy road. And I also appreciate that you give us, cyclostatigraphers, some very clear instructions on the way forward and how we can interact to better reconstruct Milankovitch cycles further back in the geological past. Thanks, Mohamed, for your time. And I would also like to thank you listeners for listening to this 13th episode of Cyclopod. See you next time for number 14.